Okay. Okay. This is um, the office of Dr. Paddy Njoku. We're here to have a one-on-one -on -one interview with him. We're going to be asking him some questions about the insecurity in Nigeria, women empowerment, child, child protection, education. So that's what you're going to be saying in the interview. Sit tight. And Had this, and today I can tell you we have 20 women under this program that were empowered oh, between no, no. 17th of March to April. Really? Yes. Oh, that's uh... women who are into poultry farms, pet businesses, and all that. Okay. There was a particular woman that a widow who roast yam by the streets. Mm -hmm. I made a post on her, and she was lucky. Someone all the way from Canada saw it mm -hmm. and paid the fees for her daughter's wife. Oh, no, no. So we've been doing this and God has been helping us. So we okay. want you to lend your voice to okay. what we're doing. Well, I am, um, I am very enthused and encouraged that um, people like you are not waiting till you become president or governor or minister to be able to, to raise those who are lower than you. Um, you have all my encouragement, and I believe that the level of society where you are also intervening is the level that can help us bring security to our nation. Because if that woman who is roasting yams is able to bring up somebody tomorrow who can help her family, you would have raised the whole generation. Yes. That child, who probably would have become a kidnapper or an armed robber or an insurgent, will now find a positive way of development. Uh, I think I will want to support your people. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very grateful, sir. Um, incidentally, um, the Bible wasn't very fair to widowers. It was always talking of widows' might. <laughs> the widow and all that. But I will extend to you my widowers' might. No problem, sir. <laughs> Thank, you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We're very grateful, sir. <laughs> so please keep, keep it up. Thank you very much, yeah, sir. Don't be daunted. No problem. Feel great doing Thank what you, you are doing. Please. It, um, it really enlivens my spirit. 
Thank you very much. I'm grateful. Let me tell you, it's a great pleasure. It's a great pleasure to have you, Dr. Paddy in Joko, Kendi, and Ambassador too. It's an honor to have you. My evening. pleasure. My Thank pleasure you to have you. So, Ambassador Dr. Paddy in Joko is someone um, I celebrate, I appreciate you. He's a man who wears so many caps that if I begin to read out his portfolio, I'm sure that we're going to take so much time. But we'll leave that towards the end of the, of the interview. But first of all, I want to start, sir, may we meet you? Yeah, Can you tell us more about you, who you are? A common man of Nigeria. You know, there are newscasters, when they said the common man, they show people walking in the streets. <laughs> I'm one of them. Um, essentially, a peace builder, chartered mediator and conciliator, chairman, national chairman of the fellowship of partners for the protection of ethics and values. And most essentially, a family father, community leader. Great. So, from your resume, I, I could see that you were former area manager in North Spectrum Books Limited, former assistant registrar, Federal University of Technology at Bogota, former senior assistant registrar, University of Lagos. Former President General, Nigerian Community in Cameroon. Former National President, Institute of Chartered Mediators and Cancellators. Former President General, Imo Community Abuja. Member, Nigeria Institute of Management. It, the list goes on and on and on and on. So my next question is going to be, with the present situation of education in Nigeria, and your days as a chairman, governing board of National Examination Council, NECO, would you say the standard has been sustained or declined? Well, there is this tendency for people to always refer to the good old days. Whether you like it or not, we are in 2021. Some people looking at 2015 of Nigeria's realities and history will be telling you when they talk of 2015, they say in the good old days. And some others, pre-independence elites will be telling you of the good old days of pre-independence. Some others talking about immediate post-independence era of Nigeria will still be talking of the good old days. So if you get all that together, it seems that the further you go, the better the old, uh, the old days become. So that answers your question. So, but is it actually, is it supposed to be so? I thought uh, things ought to get better over the, over the years. Yes, in principles, that's how it's supposed to be. But from your experience and mine, um, the reality seems not to be so. Uh, ten years ago, or rather, you've talked of, talked of the time I was area manager Spectrum Books, area manager North. You know what I used to do? I used to travel in a Volkswagen car around the north of Nigeria from one local government to the other. And I knew every local government. And my traveling knew not day or night. Once the engine could move 
I will move. But today you can't move like that. So that shows you that those old days are good old days. It's happening in our education. Unfortunately, the easier things seem to get. The more dangerous, the more difficult you really feel they are. We now have computers, we have all sorts of things, information, technology, and all that that should make life much easier. But unfortunately, in practical terms, the children seem to be uh, having it easy, but not enjoying as much as we enjoyed having it hard. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. That's welcome. So, uh, the most pertinent question I'm going to be asking now is in the area of insecurity in Nigeria. You talked about uh, the days where you could travel at any time you wanted to travel, whether at night, at any time, then everything was much safer. The roads were safer. You were not afraid of Amdrabas. You were not afraid of kidnappers. But today, even during the broad daylight, sometimes you get scared to even travel by the road. So as the ambassador of peace, Universal Peace Federation. What do you think that the government is not doing right? Or what would you advise with your vast experience and knowledge in the area of peace to help a government curtail the activities of the Boko Haram kidnappers, the bandits, the insecurity generally in Nigeria? Thank you very much for this very salient uh, question. Um, I don't always like to look at security as what happens when I travel on the road or I'm sleeping at night. I look at security in a global format. The moment you don't have educational security, mm -hmm. you don't have job security, security, you don't have food security, you don't have health security, accommodation security, then physical security is zero. If people were employed, what would happen is, I mean, in most developed economies, people want to achieve 90% employment rate and probably between 5 and 10% unemployment rate. And then you judge governments by improving this employment rate. And so in the morning, people go to their businesses or factories where they are workers. They don't have time thinking of kidnapping you on the road. They want to work. They want to produce the air conditioners we are using here now, the lightings, the razor blades we use to shave, the toothpaste we use to brush, and everything. But unfortunately, we think that we can sell one product and get the money to buy all these things. And then people would not be employed producing them. So we become a consumer nation. And when the money we get from our monoproduct economy comes in, not everybody has to get in their own part of the money. It's not enough. So people start wondering what they should do. Uh, some philosopher says um, there are no principles, there are only circumstances. Mm. So most of the time, it is the circumstance that determines the principle. What has turned many people into bandits, armed robbers, kidnappers today is the situation in which they have found themselves in their families, in their communities, and in the nation. Somehow they have to survive. And to survive, 
they have to become predators on others they feel are living better than them. This is the crux of the matter. As long as we don't have these other securities, the physical security becomes a mirage. Unfortunately, much as we preach, like you said, in our ethics and values organizations, in our ambassadors for peace and peace builders organizations, those seem to become theoretical preaching. When you offer somebody a job today, he seems to worship you more than the angel he doesn't see, even though the angel might have facilitated you are offering him that job. And so, as much as possible, a, pop a nation with a population of 200 million people, where only about 10% are fully employed, is an oven where souls are being born alive. And that is why we must try as much as possible, not just to sit back and blend government, but also take our own part of the responsibility. What have I done to keep somebody employed? What have you done? government cannot employ everybody. And the people who are pillaging this money, what do they do with it? It's not just enough to go and build a palace where many rooms are unoccupied and then you are surrounded by beggars who are homeless and who have no food and who have no employment. It's not enough to use the money to go and buy houses in self heavens where you run to when you feel you are sick and the medical facilities in our nation cannot take care of you but if you die there they bring you back to us to bury this is the crux of the matter okay like you said something which is very striking you said everyone has to play their part yeah. to make the nation work which i agree with you there are some individuals who are working tirelessly to make this nation work, regardless of you know the obstacles or the challenges they face. A lot of things you know pose as challenges, making them finding it difficult to be able to employ people. For instance, we talk about the lighting issue in Nigeria. There are people who have industries who would want to build industries or already have existing industries, but cannot because of the obstacles before them. So what do you think they can do to make this thing work? Because they must have an enabling ground to be able to employ people. Yes. Um, the question or the point you raised is also a very salient one. For you to operate optimally, there must be some given points you have to have when i was talking about security you have to have um, electricity supply mm -hmm. security water supply security when these securities are not there it becomes difficult for you to create security for yourself and unfortunately for us what is happening is that every elite today in this nation seems to be a mini local self-government. So please, can you draw one light on just what you just said? What I mean by mini local self-government is that you employ your own security people to guard you, you sink your borehole to give you steady supply of water. You buy many generators, electricity generators, 
to provide adequate supply of electric energy. And of course, by the time you finish all this, the main capital you were supposed to infuse in your machinery is already overspent expended. and expended in these ancillary um, and items. So you look at yourself as somebody running a government by himself or herself, for himself or herself, and that's what we mean by self government or local government based on the self. And unfortunately, the result is that such people now lose faith in the, in the system and overall government. It's as if the government is doing nothing for them. And they have to look for private schools that can provide adequate education for their children that can last throughout the year without the teachers going on strike. And it's not sustainable at the national level. There's a question I'm going to be throwing at you now. You know, sometimes when we talk about women empowerment, people look at us as feminists. You know, anybody who advocates for women, they look at us as terrorists. This one has come with trouble. But I want to ask you a question. You were one time or still, you know, what we have now is sustainable development goals. You were one time an ambassador of the development goals that paved way for the sustainable development goals that we have now. And part of the goals, I'm going to be talking about one uh, SDG 4, which is quality education, and then SDG 5, it talks about women empowerment, reducing inequalities, you know, gender inequality, and then making the woman and the girl child empowered. So what would you say has Nigeria, to a large extent, been able to achieve? the goals, and at what extent would you still be able to achieve it? And if you have not, what would you advise? Not just to the government, to everybody, because we all have a role to play. Yes, I think this question touches the earlier questions you asked. We shouldn't abdicate our responsibility and wait for government to do it all for us. The men shouldn't also assume that they are the only breadwinners of the family. In essence, it is the mother who gives, who suckles the child the first time the child opens his or her mouth, or its mouth to eat, it falls on the mother. And that's what they said, the, uh, the, the, the mother who suckles the child, the cradle that suckles the child, rocks the world. Rocks the world. And so, this breast that suckles the child must be adequately equipped to do so. The child's first language, the first words the child learns are from the mother. What because it is in the process of that circling the doors that we starts mind. hearing <laughs> the <wind> sounds <laughs> but I will extend to and understanding their meanings. No problem, sir. <laughs> and that's why Thank you, sir. Very talk that. of <laughs> your mother tongue. So please keep, keep it up. Thank you very much. Yeah, so the more that feel great plays a very important please. role in the life it, um, of the child, it so really also in life of women folk. Play a very important role in the life of the nation. I think it is more of self deceit and self denial if we ignore the importance of the woman in the stability of the home, the stability of the community, the stability of the nation, and that of the world. 
If they call you feminists, you should embrace that with all pleasure. Do you know that the men don't have a word like that? <laughs> there are no masculinists. <laughs> you understand? So you have no comparison as women because no man plays the role of a woman. And for those of you who are Christians, you see in the creation story in Genesis, in the Bible, he said, and God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Because when the man is, in, is alone, there is something lacking. And that is why the woman is complementary. Being complementary means it completes the man. So we as a nation, we as, a, as communities, we as families should as much as possible empower the women. Otherwise, those goals you are talking about set by the United Nations will become empty talk. The woman manages the home. That's why the man, in spite of how much he earns, must bring out to say, my wife, please take and use this to feed me and the family and my friends. If you leave it for the man alone, the, poor, the, the very rich man who is nominally rich may die of hunger because he doesn't have the time to organize himself. So I totally agree with you that there has been a neglect of the importance of the role of women in nation building. And by our very nature, we have what we call mother generals. Those people are the people who take care of the community. You wouldn't know that this woman is not the direct mother of this child. But the woman brings the child clothes, feeds, advises, nourishes the child. So we are failing in that regard. Because I can tell you, in the area of our politics now, if we check the re women representatives in the, in the Senate or in the House of Representatives, we don't have much women there. And uh, I don't know if I would say the, the opportunity given to women. You know, when the elections are coming, they use the women to ask for votes. That is when you begin to see a woman leader everywhere, gather the women for us. But when it comes to implementing things that will benefit the women, they still don't involve us. And the only person that can speak for the women, I think, is the women. So if we are lacking in the area of representative in the women in the women folk, I think there's a whole lot of problem for us. Because the man may not really be able to speak for the woman as much as a woman will speak for a fellow woman. So what would you say or what would you advise the government to do in this regard? Because sometimes the political meetings are done at night. And some of these women are married. And you don't expect a woman to leave her house at 12 midnight to go for a political meeting. So why is the meeting not done during the daytime? Because our people still think that politics is war. And it is the men who go to war and who go to the war front. And if you like, compare that with all other aspects of our politics. So winner takes all, his might is right, and invariably, unfortunately, the woman is not made for this. The woman, if you like, is a pacifist. Is somebody who wants equity. 
is somebody who wants justice. And unfortunately, our politics is still far from being practiced on these principles. Look at a country like Germany. Angela Merkel has been there in a country that produced people like Hitler. She's been there for more than a decade. Theresa May was there in the United Kingdom. And mind you, the government of the United Kingdom is Her Majesty's government. She goes to inaugurate the parliament. That's to show the power of the woman. So this is what I'm telling you. That's how the politics of the place affects the role that the woman plays. If it is a politics of do or die, unfortunately nobody wants his mother, his daughter, or his wife to, to, to go and do or die. And as you said, if it's, a poly, if, it, if it's the politics of midnight caucus meetings, nobody who has a loving wife like you would like her to go for a caucus meeting that will start at midnight, which you don't know when it will end. But that is not to say that, yes, it is a given, and we must take it like that. We must start clamoring for change. If you remember the Ba women's riot in 1929, you will know that it is the women who came to save the men from colonial overtaxation. So we must learn to use our women folk in a politically correct manner to get the best out of them. And we have seen that we've been able as a nation to produce women who are appreciated outside, outside. our oh, own shores. That means that we are shortchanging ourselves by not giving the the, our women folk the opportunity to bring Our out best. the best in them. That means we are playing with half of our team. And at the international level, we may not be able to win matches because we play with half of the team. Thank you very much, sir. Most welcome. Before we continue, I, I would like to welcome Mr. Okujala to ask his questions. Thank you very much, Jala. Um, thank you very much, Doctor, for this opportunity. Thank you, Uko. With you. Um, doctor, I want to start from uh, your office. I've seen a lot of books, a lot of uh, awards. awards collections of um, certificates and all of that. And even from your portrait here and from your CV, you were once chairman, governing council of National Examination Council of the Republic. Yes. I want to know what you did differently to improve the quality of your education. Yes. As compared to your time back in the days, the old good days, yes. and today, I want to know what you brought to be, what you did differently as a chairman. Thank you very much for that question. Um, most of the time, people don't ask that question, and I, I don't just get up on myself. I mean, uh, by myself, and start talking about the changes I made, the improvements I brought. I came to be chairman of the governing council of NACO when the issue of 
magic centers mm -hmm. yes. for examinations mm -hmm. was rife. Special when they were talking of so yes, when they were talking of sorting uh, vigilators and all that, I came and discussed dispassionately with my board and told them that I did not sort anybody out to be able to pass my own exams that I came from a family where my parents, my father and my mother, were illiterate. And I became the most literate person in that family by virtue of going to secondary school. And so I never bought anybody to enable me pass any examination, whether internal or external. And what we found was that unfortunately some parents were financing the examination malpractices that were going on and buying opportunities for their children to pass. So, as an educationist in my own right, I also realized that when these children buy the success at that secondary school level, they now create problems when they enter the tertiary institutions of learning. I was a university administrator, and I know the agony of lecturers when the children pass jam and come in, and they could not yes succeed in educating those children. So, one major decision I took with my board was to introduce what we called external monitors in schools and centers during the NECO examinations. And 90% of these examination uh, monitors, external monitors, were staff of tertiary institutions of learning. And whenever I address them, I said, look, if you don't do this job thoroughly, don't start blaming anybody tomorrow when they bring some blockheads. Like garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. So what happened then was that the supervisors would go, NECO staff, the, uh, the invigilators, and so on and so forth, some staff of the, the centers. and uh, But suddenly, they would get external monitors who had no strings attached. And they would objectively monitor what was going there, do their reports. And based on those reports, would now assess the performance of the centers, whether they were secondary schools or continuing education centers, would now assess them objectively. I'll give you an example. I had a house, a house uh, made here who, went, who took excuse to go and collect her WAIEC and NECO results, incidentally, from a pie bomb. So she traveled and came back and brought the results. I said, show me. She showed me. I said, you did better in WAIC than in NECO. Why? He said, oh, God, don't mind those NECO people. They're very wicked. <laughs> I said, do you know whose signature is here on this year? <laughs> she said she doesn't know. 
I said, it's me. Yeah. I signed this certificate. Maybe that's why you are punishing me without giving me good food. <laughs> she said, sorry, sir, I didn't know that you, you had anything to do with this. these people. We think they are wicked because they were too strict the way they were monitoring every bit of our examination. Doctor, I want to say something. You know, there's this saying that children born in the 70s, the 60s, 70s, and uh, any part of 80s lived decently and they were all raised well. In life, I, I think what we needed to do is uh, we need to impact whatever we have learned to our children. So what happened? I think there's a disconnect somewhere. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because what we ought to have now, we need to, we ought to have children who are better than we, but we're seeing the opposite. Then there is a problem somewhere. The moral decadence, where did it all start from? It started from 1966, when a man woke up in the morning as a major, worked hard as a major. At night, he committed something, and the next day, he became his excellency with immediate effect. I've always said it, whether people like it or not. The military coup is armed robbery. If a thief comes to your house and the thief is caught or you pursue the thief, he will run away. If he's caught, he's sent to prison. But a man gets up one night and stages a military coup. Mind you, the other armed robber came to steal what belongs to one man. Mm -hmm. But, to but this to one police, steals what belongs to the entire nation. And instead of running away, he now positions himself and you must worship him with immediate effect. Every other thing he does is with immediate effect. From that moment, we lost the virtue of patience, of hard work, process. Process, laborious process that ended in success. It started in January 1966. And even when the civil regime came, we had already imbibed a military culture. Our constitution was militarily prepared. Every other thing has become this with immediate effect. Tomorrow morning, you have left this class, you've jumped to the other class. So that gentle, laborious process of becoming was destroyed, unfortunately. And up till now, we have not succeeded, we have not succeeded in rebuilding it. That is why you see a man who was, in fact, a failure in your class, in your set, because he has now joined a certain group and is in the, is in the caucus, he is the one deciding your fate. And the implication of that is that when you come near him, he wants to distance you because you want to remind him of a past he wants to forget. And we as a nation must address this. We as families must address this. My children, who are your friends? He was from the home. Whom do you associate with? What does that your friend do about this or that or that or that? If we don't ask those questions, the children just watch television and see people who are addressing mobs and crowds. They will tell you they want to become politicians because they think that that is the easiest way to 
heaven on earth. Like you said, boils down to the home. Because I know something happened 2015 during the election period. That was when we were campaigning. I traveled home to see my dad. As much as I was, I wanted to go for the campaign. And he told me one thing. Because I, I was raised you know, in a very tight, but I said my father was very tough on us. And I appreciated it so much. He told me, he said, by 9 PM, I'm knocking the gates. Sure. I know campaign usually it's at night. Mm -hmm. I didn't have nobody to tell me. I had to just stay by the bus. Sure. He is, that is his house. Mm -hmm. And I must play by the room. Yeah. I remember my upbringing, so I had to just stay back home. So all these things starts from when you see a child doing the wrong thing. And I hear some parents living as a child. When you give that child food, he doesn't put it in the nose or the ear. He puts it in the mouth. Sure. So that's the more reason why when the child is doing wrong, we need to correct them. Absolutely. So a lot of parents are also pushing their children. Because I hear some parents comparing their own children to other children. This one has bought a car. This one has bought a house. What is stopping you? Yeah. Forgetting that our destinies are not the same. So it is, we need to, this moral values, we need to take it back to the home. Perfect. Where the beginning, because Perfectly the first right. five years of a child is the formative years of that child. What? When you have lost that period, is it's easier to to bend a stick that's still fresh, that to bend one that is hard or strong. So it's easier to mold the child than to mold the man. That's true. Because then it will be very difficult. Because you don't you don't learn to be left uh, to be left handed at old age. Yes. A lot of damages will be done. Mm -hmm. So if we don't get it right when they are very young, then Perfectly right, that's what I've the, been saying. The, the ills that we're seeing in the society will continue. Like we're looking about the insecurity. Some of this okay, some of this children were raised you know, in the streets, no love, no attention. They don't even know what is called mother love or father love. So they, the only way they can get back at the society is what they're doing right now. They take a revenge on society yes. because there is something society denied them. And if you were bringing your children up well, and these other ones are begging, at a certain time they want to revolt. revolt. And show those ones you brought up well that, look, you wasted your yes. time. And that's one of the things we preach in our programs. There's this program, the back to school program, we, we anchor every, every term. We encourage parents, we encourage everyone invest in education, don't wait for the government. Because the children you don't take care of today will end up continuing tomorrow. You so, need them the later no love, they, they fight back. But that is what is causing the, you asked me about insecurity. Yes. I tell people that whether you like it or not, the moment you bring, I mean you, you father 30 something children you don't take care of, simply because you can father children. Somewhere along the line, those children will revolt against the society that enabled you to produce them without taking care of them. OK? And that is why our insurgency is rising every day. And I have warned people that it could get worse. Yes. When the university graduates come out, and stay for 10, 15 years, they don't get a job. They go and take over the leadership of the insurgency from these other ones who are running them now, and the insurgency will get more sophisticated. Probably. Because with the technology and ground. That's what I'm saying. Probably more sophisticated than the security forces can handle. Because whether you like it or not, these children must grow. These children as they are coming up, you must direct their steps in the right direction. Most of the people you see playing all these pranks in politics are exhibiting negative intelligence, yes. which if they had been guided good, if they had been guided properly, we would have been a greater mm -hmm. nation. Many of them are very intelligent. And mind you, there's a very thin line between genius 
and lunacy. Very thin. So if, if you mishandle a genius, he can become a lunatic. Yes. Hmm? yes. The word genius in French is called genie. It's from there that you get engineering. It's from there that you get gin. The, what the, uh -huh. Yes, and all that. So um, if, if you handle that genie very well, you can get a genius. If you mishandle it, that genius can now become an armed robber like Oyenusi or... Well, uh, exactly. So, so most of these people, like I told you, the French said, somebody's badly brought up. Somebody missed the, seven, it's the first seven years. It's because of the way you handled... If you see a, an intelligent child, don't always shout him down or her. Yes. Try to guide. see her. Yes, how you can guide them. Most of the people who have made it in the world, Albert Einstein was dyslexic. He couldn't read. But he, the parents did not kill him just because he couldn't read. The way he reads things, he reads them upside down. Okay? So, if you can guide such people, you will now get the, the best out of them. I think that's what some of the parents to feel. Yeah. Because, you know, not knowing what's there, and that's where ignorance comes to play now. But if you have information about a particular child, you don't help the child mm -hmm. in the best way. Because if you check all these Yahoo boards, it takes intelligence. Naturally, now they do things you can't yes. do. Because if yes. you're not intelligent, the, yes. what they do on the computer, there was a board that, uh, that was interviewed, and they're asking him, how do you manage to hack people's account? account? And one the guy said, baffled everyone. In the comfort of his home, all he needs is to just buy a SIM card mm. of 100 naira mm. and send you a message. And if you're not careful, the way he would do it, exactly the way the bank, the message will come, because the message came to my phone a few days ago. And if not because I, I was intelligent enough to know that that wasn't from the bank, someone else would have talked to us from the bank. Mm -hmm. Because it came the way the bank sent their bill. Mm -hmm. So it takes someone who is very smart to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So most of these children, we are missing yes. the gift of them. Yeah. Hmm? They're using it the, the negative way now. Yeah. We're not properly guided. Mind you, every new thing, when I was telling you about Jenny and engineering, and every new thing is a further, further imagination of, I mean, it's an imagination of what didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Yes. Eh? Yes. Michael Faraday, when he discovered light, they said the man was mad. They, they wanted to kill him. How do you, what do you mean by you, you? Manufacturing light. Have you seen it before? Or like IVF now. Yes. That's, nobody would have thought that no. someday will come where you can have babies, no. even if you can't conceive naturally. Yes. So that uh, is, the, is the further imagination of the improper mind. The proper mind takes what exists and relaxes. And relaxes. Uh, the improper mind is the creative it's mind who like says, yes, yes who says, I can do something like this. Uh -huh. And then he starts overworking himself and gets it done. He becomes a discoverer. He becomes a genius. But if at the time he wanted to do that thing, you were shouting on him every day, please sit down here, do this, you must follow me. And, uh, and that's what the are better than us. Yeah. Yeah. God is so wonderful that he gives some people extrasensory perceptions that they see what we can see. They know what we don't know. But if you, if you press them down at that stage because you want them to be like you, you don't make progress in your race. And this is what, what is disturbing some of us till today. We used, our people lived here till the colonizer came. How they used to treat themselves. Nobody wants to ask again. We just dropped it. You know that the bitter cola that is there, 
has been found to have 37 curative properties. We didn't care. Mm. We waited until somebody came and discovered that for us and told us. And told us. That person now will go and use it to bring, make some medicines, tell us how many tablets to take in a day, and tell us how much to pay. It's because we are stifling the geniuses among us. We should create space for them. At times, they could do things that are unbecoming because of the way they are created. And when they do them, we should be able to accommodate and look beyond the ordinary and say, does this person have a message outside this? So otherwise, there wouldn't have been innovations. Man wouldn't have gone to space. Mm -hmm. OK? Yes. The Wilbur brothers who manufactured the airplane, people thought they were man because man has no wings, man had never flown. By, by birth, coming from where we're going to talk about uh, what happened in the times of creation, when God said, let us make man in our own image. Yes. We we're born to be creators. Yes. It is that certain people are higher than some people. And some people, they have the opportunity to harness the opportunity that God has given them. While some, like you said, some parents will want to think that the, person, the child is abnormal. In every abnormal child, there's something about that child. Yeah, the abnormal child creates an abnormal thing, mm -hmm. creates an abnormal situation, studies ab abnormal issues. Hmm? The, the regular person keeps society going but does not make much advancement. Mm -hmm. Not extraordinary. No. No, do not make much advancement of society. Thank you very much, sir. With this, we're going to call this to an end. We're very grateful, Ambassador Dr. Padin Joko. It's a pleasure. To be honest, I am overwhelmed. I learned so many things today from you. Thank you. So many things. Thank and you. And I believe that as many who are going to watch this, they will also learn too. Thank you so much. I also learned from you people. You know, yeah, learning is reciprocal. I appreciate your coming, Thank you very much, and it is uh, it is it is um, really heartwarming to see people like you deciding to do things like this. You are going out of the ordinary. You are made to want to relax in air-conditioned lounges and consume wealth that they didn't create. This, Some of us didn't create it and this is, we're also you know, investing the little that we so, have. So this is what worries us. How have we become just consumers of luxury without telling ourselves that nothing goes for nothing? For everything, there's a price to pay. There's a price to pay. And imagine someone will go to hmm? the market and buy a bag of milk or something. It's madness. Why there are thousands of children roaming, roaming the streets? I was telling my daughter the other day we were strolling. I take over secretary here. Yeah. These beggars came. Children. I told her, I say, Mommy, do you know the danger of this? If these children are not taken care of and they grow up around here, mm. after some time, they will come around to tell you that they have a right to this same house you are living in because they are human they are beings human. like you. They are human. They are human and they grew up in this environment. So why should you be staying in a five-star place mm. Why they are roaming about? And so we must find a way to take care of our products. Otherwise, we create problems for those we think are well off. And that is what is happening now. And that's why you see some of those children, some of the, the rich man children, some of them are being haunted. Yeah. You find them cults everywhere. And before you know it, you, you're, you're, you're losing their children because they become prey in the hearts of those people that you, you think, well, I'm not their father, I'm no. not their mother. Yeah, what I tell them, so, and some of these, my friends, you are pointing out, at, um, you know, when I see them, I laugh. I say, 
I say, Your Excellency, you, you, it seems you are suffering from HKV. I say, what is HKV? I say, you know there's HIV, there's HKV. I say, what is HKV? I know HIV. What is it? I say, it's high kidnap value. <laughs> so if you go out the way I'm looking at you now, this, 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 they will take you. OK, that's it's, what is happening now. OK, when the kidnapping of the school started, I told somebody, I said, this is going to be a very good business for you. If it's not caught or leaked uh, now, uh, before you know it, my southeastern brothers will begin to say, ah, this is becoming a good business. Why don't we also start it? Because That's, it's on a time bomb that if we are not careful, we'll consume everybody. Yeah, and if you are looking prosperous, eh? mm -hmm. like Uko is looking now, they will say, ah, this one who's Who's chicks? No, listen. No, no, they, no, they, no. Sorry. You. If you look like you are either one of the people who consumed that money, mm. or you may come from a family like that, they just don't want to know. They yes. pick the person and say, "Bring so many millions." Even before this kidnapping thing started, I think there was—I can't remember what year, but it's over ten years now. My youngest son was traveling from Zaire back to school, and they were attacked by robbers. You can imagine them. They took them to the bush. And when they saw her, I know she's very fair. They said, she's one of them. Mm -hmm. The father Look is the rich man. They're the ones, you, you see know, embezzling our money. That's HKV. Then, there was nothing like kidnapping them. Mm -hmm. They were like, no, this one is different. Mm -hmm. Keep her spirit. Keep her at one place. <laughs> they took her. They took, you know, God. Mm -hmm. If not for God, I say that I really they would have raped her. See? Because this is their own way of trying to maybe get back. back. You see, they took everything from her. No mind she was a student. And she was like, no, my father is no my father is the captain that they said it is not true. <laughs> so <laughs> so the kind of society we find, yeah, so, we find ourselves in. So you guys be careful, don't look like you have HKV. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> So we're just uh, come to the end of one-on-one uh, -on -one with Dr. Padin Joko. We had a very extensive and very informative time with him. I just hope that you could enjoy the interview at the end of this. Thank you very much.